Greetings, everybody. I guess this is going to be fire part, uh, part 12, part B. So I'm saving part 13 for the lake of fire, which will be the conclusion. This is uh, Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. A couple of things that were given to me, I thought that was worth sharing. It says, without the word of God, you can never know the will of God. So people who never bother to read the scriptures, they're not going to know God's will. They're not going to know the warnings that he gave. And let's face it, there are some sins that are unpardonable. So, and something else that was uh, said. If we claim God as our father, we should be willing to act like his children. Boy, that's some true stuff there, huh? All right, so this is a uh, part B, a continuation of the last study, New Testament believers. Turn your Bible to James chapter 5, and we're going to start in verse 1. It says, Go to now, ye rich men, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Now, what's up with that? Weeping and howling, rich men? Why does James say that rich men are going to weep and howl for their miseries that are going to come upon them? Well, let's take a look at Matthew chapter 19. Uh, let's go verse 16. Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Now, this word master is the same word that they translate rabbi. It's the same word. So when people tell you that rabbi means teacher, mm, yeah, well, that's an alternate meaning. But it means the main meaning is master. And of course, you should learn your master. Your master should be your teacher, right? So this one came and said, good master, what good, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he, Jesus, and he said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. Now, Jesus wasn't telling him not to call him good. But he's saying, do you know what you're saying? If you're calling me good, there is none good but one, and that is God. Now, in, John, um, in 1 Timothy 3.16, Paul writes that God was manifested in the flesh. Christ was God in the flesh. And I think what Christ is doing here is making a point. Why are you calling me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. So I think basically he's giving him a question. Are you acknowledging me as God. I mean, after all, he called him master, right? So, but the Jehovah's Witnesses will say, see, see, this is proof that Jesus is not God. But that's not what it says. He asked him, why, why do you call me good? There's none good but one that is God. So, even, you know, the thief on the cross, um, uh, 
you know, he, uh, he, well, let's take a look at that real quick. All right, let's take, I did a, an entire Bible study on the thief on the cross. Uh, I have over a thousand studies up now, and it's, sometimes it's hard to remember what, what is where. I mean, I've been, I've been on YouTube for, oh, I don't know, 10 years now. All right, so Jesus is on the cross. Luke 23, verse 38. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. So, did you notice? It says, And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, first, and Latin, second, and Hebrew, third. This is the king of the Jews. A lot of people don't know it, but Greek was the common language of business in this area because of Alexander. He's called Alexander the Great. I don't know. Uh, that's what history calls him. I don't think he was that great. Uh, but he had conquered the area, and let me tell you something. If you're going to learn the language of the conquerors, so when the when the Romans came in and conquered the area, uh, everybody was already speaking Greek, and it was you know it was a common language. So you know maybe that's why the New Testament was in Greek. It was in the common language. Everybody in the area could speak Greek. I mean, uh, Alexander had conquered basically the, uh, the known world at that time. So, this is the king of the Jews. Christ on the cross, right? Verse 39. And one of the malefactors, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? Is the thief on the cross, is he, is he acknowledging that Christ is God? Verse 41. And he says, And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath doth, doth, this man hath done nothing amiss. In other words, we're getting we're getting what we deserve, but he's done nothing. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, ah, he acknowledges Jesus as Lord. He says, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness. There was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened. Didn't we read about that in Acts chapter 2 and in Joel, I believe, chapter 3? Oh, yeah. And the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion, the Roman centurion, now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. So let's go back to the rich man in Matthew chapter 19. 
verse 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he, Jesus, said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He said unto him, Which? Oh, yeah, like, yeah, which commandment am I going to, uh, the commandments am I going to keep? I mean, there's 10 of them. Can I keep seven or eight of them? Yeah, there's this neighbor I live next to. I really hate that guy. I, I, I want to kill him or have him killed, you know, but, uh, but I'll keep the other nine. No problem. You know, well, that's my take on it. So, which Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept for my youth. What lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast. And give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Did you know you can store up treasure in heaven? Oh yeah, it sounds like if you do good deeds, you, you're storing up treasure in heaven. And he said, come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And why is that? Well, because they love their riches more than they love God. They love wealth more than they love their neighbor and probably even people of their own family. Verse 25. And when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men... This is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Now, this is interesting. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and follow thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration regeneration. I think that's the, the resurrection. In the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And people, that's in, if you want to read about that, that's in, um, it's either in Revelation chapter 20, 21, or 22, I forget which. But the twelve apostles are going to judge the 12 tribes in the 12 gates of New Jerusalem. And it's not going to be Judas Iscariot, sorry. No, it's going to be Paul. At least that's my opinion. Verse 29, and Jesus said, um, let's continue with what Jesus is saying. And everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Well, in 1 Timothy 6.10, we read, For the love of money is the root of all evil. 
doesn't say money's evil. It says the love of money. It says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. While some, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now, obviously, this is talking about humankind because, let's face it, Satan, uh, do they have money in heaven? I don't, I mean, it does, the Bible doesn't say yes or no, but I'm guessing there's no money in heaven. And when Satan fell, uh, he wasn't in love with money. No, he was, he was lifted up in pride because of his beauty and wanting power. So I think that verse that we just read about the love of money is talking about humankind, the root of all evil of mankind. All right, so let's go back to James chapter 5, verse 1. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. There's that fire again. Ye have, ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold the hire of your laborers. I'm sorry. Behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord, a Sabaoth. In other words, this guy hired him to work his his agricultural fields. And then when it came to payday, they, he wouldn't pay them. And if you want to know how that works, look up this word. K-O-L, that's one word. K-O-L-N-I-D-R-E, another word. K-O-L, uh, one word, second word, N-I-D-R-E. Yeah, take a look at that word. It's where they, the tribe makes a promise before God that they're not going to keep any promises that they make. It's like you're making a promise to somebody, but your fingers are crossed behind your back. Yeah, they make, they make a promise to God that all the vows and promises and oaths that they make are null and void. Oh yeah, you guys go out, work my fields, get all my agricultural stuff, and I'll pay you on Friday. Uh, and then Friday comes and they don't pay them. So, yeah, that's what it's talking about here. That's what Jesus was talking about when he said, let your yeas be yeas and your nays be nays. In other words, yet, let your yeses be yes and your noes be no. Verse 5. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth. Now these are the people that have ripped off the people that, that worked their fields gathering all their agricultural goods. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brethren. Now, now, we're not talking about the rich. We're talking about the brethren. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious, precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. 
Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord, for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Yeah, we're to endure, people. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, yet the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, and your nay, nay. In other words, let your yeses be yeses and your noes be no, lest ye fall into condemnation. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one. And pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias, that's the Greek rendering for Elijah. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the faith, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. All right, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1. I guess we're going to read the whole chapter. It's not that long. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the stra strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia. Uh, for those of you that don't know it, Galatia was an ancient name for France. Uh, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia. Well, that's kind of debated. Some people say it was uh, to the north of the Middle East, and others say it's France. That's where they got the name Gaul, Galatia. So, I don't know. Uh, and to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice Though now for a season, if need be, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearance of Jesus Christ. Did you know your faith is more precious than gold? And it'll be tried with fire? Oh yeah. Might be found under praise and honor and glory at the appearance appearing of 
Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen, ye love. In whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, boy, they don't preach that stuff in church, do they? You know, <laughs> there's people that if you preach obedience, that uh, they'll, there's actually churches that'll condemn you for being obedient. And, and like I've mentioned before, they'll accuse you of lordship salvation, that you're trying to earn your salvation by being obedient. Shouldn't children be obedient to their parents? And here's a hateful thing. Shouldn't wives be obedient to their husbands? That's what the Word of God says. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, verse 15, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect to persons judgeth according to every man's work, do you know we're going to be judged according to our work? That's scary. Ooh. Who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work? Pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Forasmuch as ye know that ye were not condemned, uh, were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. See, we were not redeemed with silver and gold. No, 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 no. Verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Do you know that God, before he even created the earth, foreordained that Christ would come and die for our sins? I mean, think about that. Verse 21. Who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God? Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying, in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, seeing that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof fadeth away, uh, falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word of which by the gospel is preached unto you. 
Do you know why there's 666 different versions of the Bible? Because one of them is right and the others are all wrong. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. So there are people that will tell you the Mandela effect. Oh, the word of God's been lost. Satan got into a time machine and he went back in time and he changed everything. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, really? Uh, you know, uh, Satan Satan uh, stole God's time machine. Wasn't there a movie on that? Oh, yeah, Time Bandits, right? Yeah, Time Bandits. That's what the... Um, yeah, never mind. All right, let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3. All right, 2 Peter chapter 3. And there are people that will tell you that Peter didn't write this, this letter, that this doesn't belong in the Bible. Of course, they'll tell you that none of Paul's writings belong in the Bible either. Um, so the church has been fooled for, oh, almost 2,000 years. But these scholars, they're, they're smarter than the church and everybody in the church for 2,000 years, almost. Um, I don't think so. All right, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying where is the promise of his coming for since the fathers fell asleep all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation for this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Now this is speaking in reference to uh, Genesis 6, the flood of Noah. Verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, Reserved unto fire, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. You see, in Genesis, after the flood, Noah looked and saw a rainbow. And God said that that would be a sign that he would never destroy the earth with a flood of water ever again. But, just like in verse 7, But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Oh yeah, it's not going to be water. Next time, it's going to be fire. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Yeah, when the Lord says, shortly I'll be coming back, that's basically to the Lord. It's like saying, I'll be back in a couple of days. Yeah. But a couple of days to the Lord's like a couple thousand years to us. So, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. 
and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. See, people? <laughs> you want to know how the, the um, why there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth? Because the old earth is going to be burned. It's going to be burned up. Verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? You see, people, the, 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 the burning stuff, is it's not going to affect the believers, those in Christ that are born again. No, it's going to be for the ungodly, the wicked. They're the ones that are going to be burned up and just, you know, the lake of fire and what have you. Verse 12, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent let ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul. 2 Peter chapter 3 calls Paul a beloved brother. Did you know that? That's why the Paul haters hate 2 Peter. Okay, that's why. An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Paul's wisdom is written unto us in his, his, his letters. Corinthians, Thessalonians, Colossians, uh, you know, Timothy, all those books written by Paul. Peter says that their wisdom given unto him hath written unto you, verse 16, as also in all his epistles, that's a letter, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood which they that are unlearned and unstable rest or wrestle, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. You see, Peter is saying that those that don't are unlearned don't know what they're talking about and those that are unstable, they wrestle Paul's writings and all the other scriptures unto their own destruction. I, I, you know, people that deny Paul are basically denying the one who sent Paul. Just like the, uh, the tribe that denies Christ deny the father that sent Christ. In 1 John chapter 2, we read in verse uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 22. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father, the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not, not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. If you deny the Son, you deny the Father that sent the Son. And there's churches that'll teach that the tribe that denies Christ 
has the father, but they're make, they make John here a liar because they don't. They don't have the son. You don't have the father either. You've got neither. You're in big trouble. All right. Second Peter chapter 3. Let's uh, verse 17. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. All right, let's read Revelation chapter 3. Uh, this is a chapter in the Bible that churches will never almost never read. I mean, I, I've only heard maybe one or two times in my entire life where a church has actually preached out of this whole chapter. Uh, and I've noticed when I bought Bible commentaries, uh, like I liked J. Vernon McGee. I used to listen to him back when I was a new newbie. And uh, I bought his his uh, commentary on this. He had, I think it was a five volume commentary on the Bible. And I bought like three of them. And he totally skipped whole parts of this chapter. Just, you know, it's like he would go to like verse six and then skip to verse 15. Wouldn't even cover anything in between. I noticed he, uh, anything considered controversial he just skipped over that but i'm not going to do that all right revelation chapter 3 verse 1 now this is all jesus speaking words of christ in red and unto the angel of the church in sardis write do you know that churches have angels oh yeah uh god's churches have good angels and uh, I think the TV preachers churches I think they have angels too but uh, I think they're from the other guy you know Satan the devil Lucifer I, I don't know that's just my opinion and under the angel of the church in Sardius write these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. Be watchful, and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. Ah, so here it is. Jesus is telling the church in Sardis to repent. Now, there are people that will tell you that to repent means to turn away from your unbelief. So, I want to ask a question. Why is Jesus telling a believing church to repent of their unbelief? That's in stupidity. When you hear a preacher say that to for us to repent means to turn away from our unbelief, uh, just remember that Jesus was telling the believing church to repent of what? Their unbelief? No. He's telling them to repent of their wicked deeds. There are things that are not perfect. This is a believing church. A believing church does not repent of their unbelief. Um, and one of the famous TV, uh, one of the famous internet preachers, his first name Stephen. Yeah, he he preaches that. He says repent in the Bible means to repent of your unbelief. That you don't have to repent of your evil works. Yeah, I I, I don't think so. All right. Verse 3, remember therefore how 
thou hast received and heard, and hold fast, and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And they walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Two points here. The marriage supper of the Lamb. Those that are in the marriage supper are going to be given garments, wedding garments. They're going to be clothed in white. And did you know that your name could be in the book of life and it could be blotted out? If your name could be blotted out of the book of life, uh, what's this thing that the Baptists always teach about once saved, always saved, and eternal security? And I've actually heard Baptist preachers say that once you say that 30-second sinner's prayer, oh, Jesus, come into my heart, that you're eternally secure, once saved, always saved, and no matter how much you sin, what you do, you're going to heaven. But Jesus says, but he that overcometh the same, we have to overcome. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. If your name could be blotted out of the book of life, then once saved in eternal security, doctrines are would be a lie. Wouldn't it? And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. Now, phileo is a word for love. There's two words that I know, uh, phileo and agape. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David. That would make an interesting study, the key of David. He that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. When God opens the door for you, walk through it. And if God shuts the door, you're in trouble. And remember something. On the Ark of Noah, it was God's own hand that shut the door of the Ark. Think about that. He that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. And no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Do people that use Yeshua HaMashiach, are they denying the name of Jesus Christ? Think about that. Verse 9. Let's look at the subject of verse 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Huh. Let's read verse 9, 8 and 9 again. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, 
and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem. Why New Jerusalem? Because the old one's going to be burned up. Which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now think about it, people. When you drink tea, in the summer, iced tea is great. In the winter, hot tea is great. But this isn't hot, and this isn't cold. And because they're lukewarm, God's going to spit them out. Of them have the, out of his mouth. Verse 17. Why? Verse 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich. I am rich. What did God say? What did Jesus say? That it would be easier to thread a camel through the eye of a needle for, than for a rich man to get into heaven? This right here, you could be talking about TBN, uh, the TBN channel. All the name it and claim it people, all the, uh, yeah, all the people they call charismatics flying around in their $65 million Learjets. And if you showed up on their doorstep and you hadn't eaten in a week, they probably, they would prob they, they wouldn't give you, they wouldn't give you a bowl of oatmeal. They'd probably rather throw the food in the garbage than feed somebody that hadn't eaten in a week. These people, well, of course, you wouldn't get on their front door because they got a gate and a fence around their mansion. And I'm sure they got bodyguards, armed bodyguards running around. You're not going to get anywhere near their front door. Uh uh. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not thou that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind? And naked. See, they're not going to have the wedding garments. And when it comes to the gospel, they're blind. Yeah, people. You know, Jesus said a, it would, a rich man would hardly make it into the kingdom. Verse 18. Jesus says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Now, I believe he's not talking about taking money and buying actual gold. Personally, my opinion, and if you disagree, that's okay, but I believe what he's saying here, remember when he Jesus told the rich young man, sell your possessions and give to the poor and you'll have treasures in heaven. I think that's what he's talking about here. Take the things that you have here on earth, the corruptible riches, and lay up treasures in heaven. And I think that's what he's talking about here. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. Rich where? In heaven. And white raiment. White raiment. Your wedding garments for the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Huh. If God loves you, you're going to get spanked. And he must really, really, really love me because he has spanked me. My uh, my rear end has still got marks and sore. That's kind of a joke, people. But yeah, I've he's almost killed me a few times. But uh, yeah. Verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And that, everybody, is the end of Part 12B. Part 13 is going to be fire. Should be the conclusion. The lake of fire and the doom of the unrepentant wicked and the fallen angels. Do you know, and I'll probably cover this in verse uh, part 13, but do you know that hell Hell was created for the angels. Did you know that? Just in case I forget, Matthew 25, verse 41. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand. Now this, this is, uh, you know, God's going to take those on the right hand and they're going to go into the kingdom and those on the left hand, well, just remember those uh, people love to call themselves the left wing. And they call Christians the right wingers. <laughs> They're right. They're right. Matter of fact, we should read. We should read more of this. All right. Um, let's go to Matthew twenty-five, verse thirty-one. This is worth closing out on. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels, holy angels with him. Now, you know if there's holy angels, there's unholy angels. And with all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. Isn't it interesting that the Satanists always use the goat as their symbol? Is that a coincidence? I don't think so. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left, the left-wingers, the right-wingers and the left-wingers. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, and this is what I want to hear, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee, a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my 
brethren, ye have done it unto me. You see, people, what we do on this earth, our works on this earth, have everlasting consequences. You know, I'm telling you, these TV preachers running around with their their Rolls Royces and their Learjets, oof. Well, I think verse 41 uh, applies will apply to many of them, if not all of them. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Did you know hell was created for the devil and his angels? Verse 42. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. Everlasting punishment. But the righteous into life eternal. All right, well, that's this, this is the end. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. And that's Jesus, who is the Christ, in his precious name. Amen. Stay close to Jesus, people. We have to endure unto the end. Our works, our works will show forth our faith. And don't let anybody ever tell you otherwise. So, matter of fact, uh, read James chapter 2 sometime. I did a Bible study on it. I've done a couple Bible studies on James chapter 2. Uh, Book of James. I call that the, the, the practical daily living Christianity. That's what I basically call it. So, all right. Um, Take care, everybody, and uh, look for me if one day I vanish from YouTube. I'm surprised I'm still here. And I'm going, when YouTube boots me off, I'm going to go full time writing into my book and look for me. Um, Google, you might search my name, Chaplain Bob Walker. You may not find me. Try Bing by Microsoft, may not be there. Try Yahoo, if that doesn't work. You could try DuckDuckGo, but DuckDuckGo's been bought up by um, the wicked, from what I hear. Uh, you could also try Dogpile, the search engine, and see if you could find me. And if you can, um, I'll, I'll have the book. Uh, I think the book is going to be on how I kind of think the end times are going to play out. Um, I could be wrong, but there's going to be a lot of useful information in there. Uh, a lot of useful information. Trust me. I've spent almost half my life preparing for this book. Um, and I kind of scares me sometimes because I know a lot about the devil's plans. I mean, sometimes he throws me a curve like 9-11. I didn't see that coming. Uh, but, um, you know, there's a, the future of the church is not the cities. It's the wilderness. That's going to be the future of the church. And if you don't believe me, read Revelation chapter 12. And I got a playlist on that. So you might find it interesting. All right. Um, take care, everybody. In Jesus' name, amen.